Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Independent City Council meeting. It's Tuesday, June 26th at 6 30 in the evening, and it's an absolutely gorgeous evening. Um, let the record show that everybody's here and happy. <laughs> there you go. Okay, I didn't want to project too much there. Uh, council members, you have uh, minutes from the uh, uh, June 12th uh, meeting uh, in front of you, and do they meet with your opinion? Your approval, not opinion, but approval. <laughs> oh, is it so that I, in your opinion, yes, that's it. Okay, yes. that's, a mo that's a motion I heard. It is. And, so, and I would second that opinion. <laughs> All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. Motion carries. Okay, we're going to go on to visitor public comments and uh, want to hear a little bit about the Hoffman Heritage Festival. <clears throat> Good evening. Welcome. Um, to give you a quick update on the Hoffman Heritage uh, Festival. So I am Kate Swarzler, president of the Independence Downtown Association. So we had the opportunity to um, take over the planning of the event this year. We're very excited about it. Um, we wanted to essentially keep the same intent behind the block or behind the Hoffman Heritage Party um, that has been planned in the past due to some really terrible years of weather and some declining um, attendance because of that, uh, we wanted to change it up a little bit and rebrand it, so we are calling it the Hoffman Heritage Block Party. We also really want to take the focus back onto Main Street and with our local businesses and give them the opportunity to fully participate. One of the uh, kind of major themes and feedback that we received from those businesses was that by having it down in the park, people flock to the park and kind of leave the businesses out at times. So with a lot of the summer festivals that we have, um, we thought we would do something more different and then uh, like I said, bring it back up onto the main street, really promote main street for local businesses, and have that kind of hop festival and the uh, beer trail, if you will, that brings it into the local businesses, the local restaurants. So we are going to create a passport system uh, with, like I said, a beer trail that encourages people to stop in and get their passport stamped by visiting some of the local um, businesses. Then we are also uh, encouraging businesses that don't have a restaurant or a bar to get involved in other ways um, to be able to promote their businesses and just. Um, highlight our, our downtown. Um, so we are not allowing any outside food vendors. So again, we're focusing on our restaurants and uh, bars to be able to provide that for our visitors. Um, we are going to have a street fair where we're allowing vendors to come in and set things like a craft fair. Um, we are not going to propose uh, closing down Main Street just because that is really difficult going through that whole process. Um, and we frankly don't have the numbers um, to show that we can perform that. We would like to propose closing down uh, C Street on each side of Main Street um, so that we can have a music, uh, sort of a music stage, and then again having a, a vendor fair on the other side of it. Um, we are going to have street musicians that are kind of playing along the street corners to really kind of get that uh, block party vibe uh, that people are wanting to have. Um, and then at night, starting around probably 6, 30, 7, we're going to have an opening act and then a main music act um, to kind of bring more people downtown. Uh, and then we are going to have a limited hour beer tent uh, that will be a fundraiser for IDA uh, in terms of being able to run uh, raise uh, additional funds to be able to then have the event for next year. We are also going to be focusing a lot on the heritage activities and the museum has been a really active partner in terms of how do we incorporate them into the planning of this to kind of focus on the history and the, the kids' activities as well. Um, we were fortunate enough to get a $10,000 grant from the Warren Valley Visitors Association. Uh, so they are helping us to uh, promote tourism, promote our events within the Willamette Valley. Um, and to date, we have been sending out um, kind of save the date cards. We have a vendor call out. We're working on a sponsorship package. And then next, we are going to be looking at kind of operations plan for the layout, um, and then we will be coming to the city at some point to do an ask for um, are there ways we can make a partner on providing security fencing, um, the stage, the tank, and those sorts of activities. But that's an update on where we're at right now, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions for presenters? Just a couple of comments. I just have to notice, Kate, that in the same day that this is, there's going to be an emergency drill down at the park. We had, um, I know that CERTs uh, have been talking about that. From what we understand, it was not so 
solidify it. Okay. Yeah. And they had also talked about potentially having the event further down more towards like the soccer fields and the other animals. That's, that's kind of historic, though, the emergency aspect. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, there will be a ghost walk on Friday yeah, night. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, that will be a little different this year because we're going to put hosts at all of the locations, and the tours will be more of a self-guided flavor. And we are also participating in the Fourth of July parade, so we're going to have an item float to take one of the Great. Yes, so I'm just curious of that, that East part of C Street that leads down into the park. You're saying you're closing that as well? We would like to look at um, closing it off up to the roundabout so that people can still through Osprey and get down and, and utilize the parking down there. Okay. Um, but then have, that was my concern. Yeah, yeah. but then to have kind of the beer tent or music tent. Okay. Right. Additional questions? Thanks for taking the time to uh, come and visit with us and uh, uh, thanks to Ida for uh, picking this up. I think that's a really good marriage. Thank you. Great. Uh, before we go to uh, uh, community recycling programs, I'd like to do the, uh, some public comment in here. I have several, and so we'll do that's okay with everybody. Um, first person is uh, Marianne Holtzinger. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to City Council. Thank you. My name is Marianne Holtzinger. I live in the Sunset Meadows area, Southwest uh, Independence. And I've gone to several of the planning meetings and they suggested I come here and also voice some of my concerns. So I just I made a list. So <laughs> uh, you don't mind. I'm just gonna kinda go through it and then um, we can go from there. Um, Sunset Meadows, as if you've been down there, it's really a good mix of people. We have retirees, singles, young families, and we've all gotten to know each other. And for myself, I'm retired and I put my life savings in it. So I'm here for the long haul, hopefully. So I am a little bit concerned about some of the things that I'm seeing and hearing. And one of the things is the Liberty Park. Now, nothing was on online about it. When I talked to the Planning Commission, they were going to try to rectify some of that. But we now know there are 97 homes coming in. Um, phase one is uh, the infrastructure is done. But phase two, ready to go as you start selling the lots, and some of the lots have been sold. Um, we're very concerned about the swell area. As if you are not aware, there was a creek that kind of ran behind that when during the winter months, you would have running water going through there. Very marshy type land. So what they built was a swell. There was like a 10 um, foot easement, I guess you could say. Um, that when the homeowner buys a lot, I guess they have to take care of that. Um, and that's kind of a question because that does breed mosquitoes and such. There's also a catch basin. I'm very familiar with catch basins, being from Southern California, but a catch basin here would catch most of the um, excess water. And there is a lot of water coming from 7th Street. All those long houses on 7th Street, the water drains back, not front to the street. So that is a huge, huge problem. And we're concerned because that's standing water. Now, yeah, it does it evaporate? It does over time, but it also is a breeding ground. So who maintains that? Who sprays for it? What vector control comes in and takes care of that? We'd like to know. Um, we're also concerned about the traffic. 97 homes, let's say two cars per home. So we talk about the one or 200 cars. But like even in my neighborhood, some of us have one car, and some of us have more than or where do these cars go? So um, there's only one access point at this time going into Chestnut. So that's first group of homes, would be 30 or 40 homes going in there. There's only one access in and out. That means 9th Street and Chestnut. It's going to be hit hard. We have kids that ride bikes in the street, play in the street. It's like an accident waiting to happen. And that Sunday County, the traffic on 7th. For those of you who live on 7th and travel 7th, you know what a mess that is. The streets are narrow, uh, you have to slow down and let one car pass when the other car comes down. I mean, it, it is a mess. And then trying to get up onto Monmouth. And I know the developer is going to put a turn lane in there and that would be nice, but there's no forward stop, there's no blinking light, there's nothing there. So it is a huge problem. 
we really are concerned about the punch through road. And two years ago, when I attended a traffic meeting, I was told that's about 10 years down the road. We're not planning to do anything for 10 years. Well, we're going to think of something a little bit more than 10 years down the road, the way building is going on. Um, I know that a bridge has to be built over the railroad, and I know that's like 1.5 million. I was quoted at one point. Um, or a, a punch through over to Talmadge, going through property, farm property, and that is a concern, but it's something that cannot be put off for 10 years down the road, and it needs to be addressed now. Because if we keep approving for buildings to be going on in that southwest area, what's it going to take? You know, we're putting ourselves at risk. We're putting the city at risk of an accident happening. Um, also, in the Liberty Park area, there was supposed to be a park at the lower, the, so would be the southeast corner. So today, when I was walking, um, talking to a couple of homeowners there at 7, they said, oh, nothing's going on behind us. I go, au contraire. There is. That's phase two. Congratulations. Um, they're very upset. As a matter of fact, one homeowner actually called and talked to someone in the city um, about it. So don't worry about it. There's nothing being built behind your house. That's not true. The park was moved to the other side of Mount Fur, which would be the northeast corner of that last block. Okay? Um, I don't think the homeowners there even know that that's happening. So some people are beginning to sell their houses, people. They're beginning to sell. Um, <clears throat> Brandy Meadows. Now, Brandy Meadows and Mr. Cummings, who's an engineer, um, talked at the last planning um, commission meeting, and uh, he would like to see this mixed use. And he's going to be coming before the city to talk about mixed use. His concern was the difficulty in building in the wetlands area. Yeah, it's pretty wet back there, I have to say. Um, but I didn't move to Sunset Meadows to have a mixed use right next door. I don't want to see my property values going down. And neither do the other people live there. You know, they're beautiful homes. They're, for the most part, most of those homes are very well built. And they'll still look really good 20 years down the road. Um, and that is a concern. We want to keep our values up. But I am very concerned, as well as some of the neighbors are concerned about his idea of a mixed use. And I was a little bit shocked when he said that, because he wants to see to work with him on that to change the code. So I'm sure you'll be hearing about it if it happened already. Really, what our dream is for independence, we know this is a great little bedroom community. We know that, you know, people. Corvallis can definitely live here who work in Corvallis or Salem. It's just kind of in between. And how do we make our city where it is something aesthetically where people want to live here? We put the green belts in, we put the parks in, we build quality homes, not just throwing something up because someone wants to make a buck. That's just not the way to do it. Slow and sure is Margaret and fast, quick, and correct. And that is kind of like where we're seeing it. So these are some of the issues that we brought up before at the um, planning meeting, and they said, definitely come and talk to you guys, especially about uh, the soil yeah. issue and the mosquitoes and that kind of stuff. So what I'm going to ask staff to do is to connect it. And I'm thank you for having a written, I was keeping track, but if we can have staff uh, get together uh, uh, with Ms. Uh, Ms. Holsinger and be able to get the answers to her questions, and we'd probably be interested in knowing some of the same uh, same answers uh, along the way. Does that sound? Yeah, that's fine. We can, uh, if you would be, yeah, I think Karen has your contact information. Yes. Okay, yeah, I so have we could reach out to you and try to set up a time that the, several of our staff can sit down with you and go through as many of those issues as we can, and, and then certainly we'll report back to council also that conversation. It, it would be great because when I first got issue, uh, interested in this, I went to the city website because several years ago, I actually saw a plan for what now is Liberty <coughs> Park that was actually put on the website. There is nothing. So if someone is even curious, there is nothing to look at. The only way I got those plans is I went and talked to the guy who was doing the infrastructure. As he sat through his clipboard, I took pictures and I posted it on Facebook. I shouldn't have to do that. That should be available to the public. 
but let's see what we can do. Thank you for taking the time to come in. And yes, Karen, I have the uh, there's a little slip right here. Um, Mr. Bo, I think you'd like to visit with us this evening. Good evening and welcome. Hi, Council. Nice job. Um, so yeah. I just have a couple questions about this federal flag issue I've been harping on for the last year. Uh, I'm going to get to this in one minute for a second. Um, so I went to the Independence Day's meeting last two weeks ago and asked some questions, made comments. It went pretty well, mostly. And uh, at the end of the session, I, I posed this hypothetical question. So the Confederate flag vendor that has uh, free speech protection to sell a product and thought uh, hypothetically if another vendor wanted to sell Nazi flags, would those same protections extend to them? And Ms. Thompson uh, said no. Uh, a Nazi flag is hate speech and the opinion of the city attorney, hate speech is unprotected speech. So I stopped right there, so thank you very much for that. Um, I just like something from the city attorney via the manager that says hate speech is unprotected speech. Uh, an email or something. And any other supporting framework that says uh, Confederate flag good, Nazi flag bad, some kind of supporting arguments. Did you want to? I'm not sure that's actually a distinction we can make. So I, I, you may not, you are. Our volunteer may not advise you properly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But, yeah, so anyway, I just want to clear that up because yeah. they are representing the city and if there is some distinction. But I'm saying, hypothetically, if I'm in the game. I, I understand your, and uh, I'm inclined to uh, uh, probably go the same direction as, uh, as the manager was. I, I think that was, uh, but I'm not a lawyer. Mayor. Although I do play one. So, so <laughs> an example of unprotected speech would be shouting fire in a movie theater right. because of the likely results of danger to the public because they're trying to evacuate our ring. Or the sale of yeah. either a Confederate flag or a Nazi flag, I don't think would be distinguished and I think both are by and large protected by the you know, free speech of okay. So you know, nobody submits that kind of application. I, I so agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for, I, I, I just want to take a moment. I, uh, as we mentioned last time, I appreciate and I think from visiting with council, we all appreciate your thoughts, concerns, and, and we're, for myself, I'm in the same place. And as we said in the paper, uh, sometimes the First Amendment is uncomfortable. I, uh, I don't like having to be, uh, wish we could, but we can't. Right. And so anyway, but I appreciate your passion and concern both for our community, well, and for the whole country. I just wanted to take a moment to say that. Thanks. Okay. Yes, sir. I wonder if I could just add, I was going to cover this in my manager's comments, but so a couple of things we do know since our last meeting, because we did say that we'd come back to you on some of this. You did pass at some point, uh, about a year or so, I believe, uh, a resolution of inclusion, of being an inclusionary community. We are having that made into signage that will be posted uh, proximate to, this, to that vendor, and I think somewhere perhaps at, the, at an entry point also will have handouts of that actual resolution so people can see that the city, where our values are as a city, what the council's values are. And I think also that vendor actually has been asked not to make, to make those deals this year, it may not do that. I don't yeah. know if that's possible. Yeah, I look that idea, it's, it's a possible, you know, yeah. it doesn't have to ask. So thank you for taking the time to come in, I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, is there anybody else who has public comment at this point? I'm gonna keep us moving then, uh, Mr. Klein. You have uh, comments about the community recycling program. I think uh, there's a staff report and... Uh, well, I'm gonna, well, yes. <coughs> and we may, this may be a little bit longer than just a very brief report because I think we're gonna hold a couple things and the same things all together. Please do. So you, you do have a staff report from us. Since that time, we have sent you a copy of the staff report from the city of Monmouth and, and their city manager. Uh, with us tonight is Josh Brandt, the owner, the new owner of the uh, operation. Uh, I just want to say that I think you know, the city of Monmouth gave that uh, probably a little more urgency than we did in our approach to it. I think we took the traditional approach that you know if you're going to consider a, you know, a rate adjustment, 
you would want to have a hearing together with that. Not necessarily, really, this is not really being presented as a raise for judgment, but rather a surcharge on existing rates. It, it is a bit of a distinction, and it is more likely to be temporary in nature. Um, so if you did want to consider that this evening, you do have a form of resolution that has been shared with you that you could take that up tonight if you wanted to act. I know that Rance is anxious to look to get an early uh, onset of, of that surcharge so they can be able to start playing catch up. Clearly, they're on the losing end of what's going on in the, the recycling market. But, you know, primarily China. That we, you know, all of us have been impacted by the fact that we are now limited to just plastics one and two, which is only 25 percent of the of the plastic waste stream that we can do. In addition, he's, you know, brands have seen somewhere between a three and four time increase in, or decrease in the revenue that they get off their coal mingled uh, products. So it's clearly they're losing money, they lose money every month, and they don't want to fall any further behind them. They, then they have to, they do need to, you know, we need them to, you know, we need them to be flush and operating in the, uh, in the black uh, as our sole provider of those services. So if you have questions, I, there's not a lot that I can feel Josh is here, you can certainly speak to more of those, but if you wish to take that up this evening, we have no objection. You have the form of record date of resolution in front of you to consider that. If you have further questions, we certainly can take this in the in the path in the way we've taken this up in the past. Oh, yeah. Do you have the resolution? Yeah. Oh, we'll have the resolution. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you received that electronic in advance. It's, yeah. it's the same. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Councilor, since you uh, since we're putting this all, do you have questions for staff about and and if staff can answer them, uh, Mr. Brandt is here, so we can. We're going to just fold this all together if that's okay with everybody. And we'll just. So, if, please do. I've done some individual research and talking on this. And uh, I thought, first of all, that the itemizer observer did a very good job in their uh, reporting on it because it was very clear about how the uh, opportunities to um, deal with our mixed recycling have gone down significantly. I am proud when I go to other states and they say, what's recycling? Because that's something I think that we have as a real advantage of Oregon as Oregonians. And frankly, for myself, I would pay an extra do a dollar and 90 cents a month just to have that ability to recycle. I think doing differently would be a step backwards. Do other people have questions or thoughts about this that you want to ask anybody? Mr. Brandt, can I ask a question? Yeah, of Thanks. Thank you for coming in today. Yeah, of um, have you folks put out, uh, I've, I've read a little bit of the papers and I've been following it. Sort of, have you folks put out um, recycling information that with, under the new rules to local residents? Have you yes, we have. Actually, in the bills, it just started to go okay, out. Just started. Um, we're a little bit behind. Um, part of that is my fault. Um, I wouldn't say behind, but. Um, I was kind of hoping something bigger than me would come in and resolve this situation, um, whether it be China accepting something, whether it be government bigger than me coming up with a plan, Oregon itself coming up with a plan, and it just isn't there yet. Um, unfortunately, uh, the prices are skyrocketing from our processor. Um, just to go into a little bit more detail, um, the I used to get anywhere between zero and seven dollars a ton. I take an average of 100 tons there a month. I am now paying an $107 a ton, actually $107.51. So it's roughly about a $10,000 swing a month. Um, you add that with cardboard that is as low as $24 a ton right now. And you add yard debris, which is a very expensive thing when it comes to those three plastic being the big one it is a big hit to us uh, right now and so kind of to get back to uh, getting things out um, we've done that we're in the works of creating a website um, that if i'm hoping fingers crossed for the first time in 65 years we will have a website and the ability to pay online uh, the for that is in august i am trying to bring us back from 1970 to 2018 um, it takes a little bit of time so yes there are a few things that we have maybe planned 
one thing that I presented to the city of Monmouth was uh, Clay Warner, who is actually the supervisor, supervisor, the operations supervisor at Garden Services, which is where we take our home and gold cargo. He lives in Monmouth. He's a Monmouth resident. He has offered up his time, um, and I offer up mine to have any meeting anywhere for both communities um, if they want to hear on a bigger scale where the processor plans on going. Unfortunately for me, there's not a lot of outlets for me to take commingle. Um, most of the outlets that I could use are actually far more expensive than garden services even is. And so, um, unfortunately, they're, they do pay the price. I have an additional follow-up question. Is, is there anything that we as a community or collective communities can do to uh, uh, make our recycling more desirable? Or are we just too small a cog in the, in the giant world of international recycling? Uh, not really. There's some things that I have in mind. Um, they're maybe a little bit big. Um, part of it is uh, my facility is dated. Um, I would like to see a facility change in the next five years with that, um, with community help. We could actually possibly figure out a way to advance our and make a state of the art recycling facility. Um, if I can separate every single commodity, there is profit in that. Unfortunately, the commingle that happened 15 years ago or so uh, was great then. Um, now, with the market difficult, it makes it very hard because we have to retrain people that have been doing it for 15 years to say, hey, and by the way, now it's only ones and twos, and it's got to be, although it's always been this way, but it's clean to drive. Um, it definitely creates an issue for the consumer as well, which I understand. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, on a good note, is our community. Um, we've been working hard kind of behind the scenes. Um, I sort through my 24-hour depot, uh, arms deep, every day, and I sort through that myself um, to help cover costs and control that. Um, but as a community, we were sitting about 14% uh, contamination. We have got it down at times as low as seven, uh, which is actually really good statewide. Um, but some sit um, quite a bit higher than that. And there are a few that are lower than that. Lincoln, uh, Lincoln City is really good with theirs. Um, so I've been trying to reach out to see what they do differently. Um, they have different services though. Um, but uh, we are moving in the right direction. Um, again, this is indeed creating something just randomly. Um, it is a national problem and definitely a state problem. And Thank unfortunately, you. I'm just trying to find a balance. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Are there additional questions for either staff or Mr. Brandon this evening? Thank you, gentlemen. Um, counselors, how do you want to do this? What do you want to do? We can, uh, we can consider uh, a, uh, a fee surcharge, we can consider to do nothing, we could do, you know, uh, the, the world is open to us, but I think, I think the case has been made that uh, th th this is not a, uh, this is probably something we need to take, to take a look at. And uh, uh, I'm okay. thinking of a lot of other great options to be honest. Yeah. I, I think this might be our best our, yeah, our best yeah. option. What do you vote? I I mean, I would say that you look like your whole job. Okay, and I like your services, so I feel that we should pitch in and help them out as much as we can. Okay. Um I'd also if I could sorry to interrupt. Um what we what we kind of implemented to in the city is maybe a six month reconvene, uh, see where the market's at. Again, we're not actually trying to make money on it, we're trying to cover it. So currently, right now, that dollar ninety is still six, I lose 16 cents every stop. That doesn't include my truck or my driver. Um, but um, we're just trying to find a good number. Uh, I took an average, uh, as you can see, at the report. Um, that'll hopefully get us there, and then we can re, re or, you know, reconvene and find out for six months. Thank you. You know, I think that's a really good suggestion that uh, we take a look at this in January. We have, you know, if we decide to do something, we have it come back to us in January and uh, see if anything's changed, plus or minuses. And I, I do recognize that this is this is not a this is not a, a additional profit. This is covering legitimate expenses that that they have. 
Does that sound like an approach? I like the idea that uh, Monmouth has already done some work on this, and I think we would be um, uh, in a great place to be able to show some solidarity. Yeah, and, and I really appreciate the fact that uh, our staff has said, hey, they, uh, our uh, sister city did good staff work on this also, and uh, we're in so I think we're all, are, I, unless I'm reading this wrong, I think we're all saying the same thing. If that's okay, if somebody wants to suggest specific action, you can do so at this time. <laughs> I move to approve a $1.90 surcharge on all carts, UOW recycling, UOW yard debris and container services. Um, oh. Oh, sorry. I, I move to adopt resolution number eight, uh, 18 1484. Okay, I have a motion second. and a second. Um, is everybody okay with that? Uh, I just have a question. Uh, <laughs> do, we, do we need to add in there that we'd like to look at this again? Right. That one? right. And I, I was going to ask staff about that. Uh, do we need to include that in the resolution or? Um, can we leave that open and bring that back? Which uh, I think you can leave that open and then just ask that they they return in six months. I have a tracking log. You have a tracking log. All right, Cal Council, feel okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Go forth and do good. <laughs> Okay, um, we have a public hearing on the CDBG Business Oregon grant application. Do I have that correct? You do. Thank you. And just I don't know. Hmm? Just okay. So we have Diana Spike Yeah, I'll open, I'll open the public hearing and uh, good evening. Good evening. And welcome to City Council. Well, thank you. You know, I have to say the last time we were before you with this request was in 2006 in the old building. And I dare say you've really made some changes. Anyway, for the record, my name is Diana Satanovich. I'm a program developer with Polk Community Development Corporation with office in Dallas, Oregon. We serve all of Polk County. So I am before you this evening, as Karen has kind of pointed out, to um, in the series to take comments from citizens on both the community development needs and the housing needs in the city or county and this proposed project for grant funding. And so I'm just going to read into the record what is required. Please. The City of Independence is eligible to apply for a 2018 Community Development Block Grant from Business Oregon. Community Development Block Grant funds come from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. The grants can be used for public facilities and housing improvements, primarily for persons with low and moderate incomes. Approximately 12 million will be awarded to Oregon non-metropolitan cities and counties in 2018. <clears throat> the maximum grant that the city or county can receive is 2 million 500,000. The maximum grant a city or county can receive for a housing rehabilitation project is $400,000. The City of Independence is preparing an application for a 2018 Community Development Block Grant from Business Oregon for a Polk County Regional Housing Rehabilitation Project to provide housing repairs essential to health and safety in Independence, Monmouth, Dallas, Fall City, and Polk County. It is estimated that the proposed project will benefit at least 25 persons, of whom 100% will be low or moderate income. A public hearing will be held, is being held, in Independence before the City Council at 6.30 today on June 26th at the Independent City Center, 555 South Main Street, Independence, Oregon. The purpose of this hearing is for the Independent City Council to obtain citizen views and to respond to questions and comments about community development and housing needs, especially the needs of low and moderate income persons, as well as other needs in the community that might be assisted with a community development block grant project and this the proposed project. 
written comments were welcome also and would, would have to have been received by June 22nd, 2018 at the Independent City Center, 555 South Main Street, Independence, Oregon, 97351. Both oral and written comments would be considered by the Independent City Council in deciding <coughs> whether to apply. The location of the hearing is accessible to persons with disabilities. Please contact Karen Johnson, City Recorder, at 503-838-1212 if you will need any special accommodations to attend or participate in the meeting. More information about Oregon Community Development Block Grants, the proposed project, and records about the City of Independence past use of Community Development Block Grant funds is available for public review at 555 South Main Street, Independence, Oregon, during regular office hours. Advance notice is requested. If special accommodations are needed, please notify Karen Johnson, City Recorder, at 503 so that appropriate assistance can be provided. Permanent involuntary displacement of persons or businesses is not anticipated as a result from the proposed project. If displacement becomes necessary, alternatives will be examined to minimize the displacement and provide required reasonable benefits to those displaced. Any low and moderate income housing that is demolished or converted to another use will be replaced. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was a very complete anal uh, uh, announcement. It's a required. I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> So, council members, do you have uh, questions of the speaker? I would just offer the comment that I'm glad we're taking a look as a county at low and moderate uh, uh, housing needs uh, for people in the community, and in our and, the, and I mean the, the broad community. So I'm glad we're taking a look at that. You you don't may not know this, but Independence is part of the regional housing rehabilitation. And this is our this will be our seventh application. Every two years we apply for funds. Are there additional questions or any comments to be made from the council at this point? Is there anybody in the public out there that wishes to speak related to this matter? Hearing, not seeing anybody moving forward without objection, I'm going to close the public hearing. We good? I think you have to do the approved application. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah we, we have, yes, now that we've closed the public hearing, we need to uh, approve that the uh, staff move forward and uh, make the application. Okay, yes. well, thank you very much. Thank you. If someone would uh, make the appropriate motion, please. Okay, I, please. I, I move that the city of independence apply for a 2018 community development block grant from Business Oregon to provide housing rehabilitation assistance for owner occupied low to middle income households in Polk County. A motion, second, and a second. Is there discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to come and see it. We do appreciate it. Moving forward, uh, I have uh, in front of you, uh, well, first, under just announcements, I'll just let you know, I had the pleasure of working with Regional Solutions this last week as we're trying to move forward with a number of economic development efforts. And uh, we had some very difficult decisions trying to figure out uh, what to recommend to move forward for possible funding for business or again. So we met at the Capitol Building Governors uh, Conference Room and uh, I, I served on one of the gubernatorial appointments along with some kind of commissioners, uh, uh, private sector folks, and other mayors. And so, uh, lest you think I don't do anything sometimes. <laughs> Was, so much. Yeah, I used a vacation day for my real job, and my wife was like, okay, you know, when are we going to use some of that for us? Um, in your packet, council members, uh, you have, uh, there is a vacancy on the Planning Commission, and uh, I'm uh, recommending Kate Schwartzler uh, to be uh, a midterm appointment for the Planning Commission. You see her application in there, and I think we all know her. Does that sound okay? Yeah. If someone would officially make this okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Second. I have a motion to second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Uh, continuing forward, um, 
let's uh, we have uh, council liaison reports and uh, let's just move through these and wait we go. Uh, so with my net there's a few positive things to um, talk about first um, I think when we put past the budget the last set you looked at uh, the, the fee schedule from the that mine had supplied to us. Um, I think with the debt service, we're all seeing it go the way we want, where the cities are contributing less and mine it's getting more. Um, I'm sure everybody's seen the um, kind of gig deal uh, billboards around, so um, that is related to mine that now offers gigabit service, uh, internet service. So anybody who feels their service isn't quite fast enough, give them a call. They'll speed you up. And then um, when Congress failed to act on the FCC rules it was a couple weeks ago, net neutrality was basically effectively repealed. And um, MyNet has issued a statement basically saying that <coughs> net neutrality will continue to live on in my, with MyNet. They will do everything in their power uh, to continue to uphold this the same standards of net neutrality as if they were still in place. Great. Thank you for your report. Moving forward, uh, Parks and Rec Board. I actually apologize. I didn't have a report for that. Okay. That's, so, Planning Commission, Councillor Martin Willis, do you have anything uh, we should? Um, yeah. Um, Mr. Young came before the Planning Commission to um, request uh, a height extension on the building going in uh, along C Street there behind Brew, um, and that uh, was granted. It's a lot of under so he's good to go. Great. Okay. I'm going to keep us moving forward. Also, Mr. City Manager, I think you have a report. Then go ahead and get it from there. Well, if with your indulgence, I wonder if you could let the uh, our consultant team from Portland go ahead of me, and then I'll pick up after that. So that would be the park's master plan in Greenwood Consulting. Sound good with everybody? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Folks, and the ball's <laughs> yours. Okay. Sir Viner, do you want to uh, introduce this? And, uh, Which one I want to provide a link in here. Thank you. Appreciate um, that. So, uh, just yeah, by way of background, here you all familiar. In 2015, we did a parks master plan update. Um, took a lot of a look at all of our parks system here in the community, um, just yes. trying to identify things that were already there, things we really want to see happen in the next 20 years, changing trends in recreation. You know, really just take that off that big picture perspective. One of the things that came out of that plan was looking at um, the entirety of the two and a half miles of river frontage that we own, and really trying to conceptualize that as a as kind of a unified block or greenway uh, for, for recreation in the community. Uh, I'm kind of trying to stall a little bit so I can have a visual steal along with my thing, but it's <laughs> um, Anyways, uh, you know, you, you've all seen the, the nice image that we have of that, that area. Uh, and it is also that we've, we've really kind of begun to work on that. We've got the amphitheater there, the, the soccer fields are there at the north end of town with the boat ramp. We've got the dog park in, there's a lot of, of, of pieces that are right there. Um, and now, you know, one, one of the other things that that uh, particular diagram looked at was Riverview Park and saying, okay, you know, you know, the amphitheater really is a jewel of the community. The rest of Riverview Park, though, uh, still really kind of remains in its original 1970s era uh, condition, uh, which really was influenced by you know, the presence of boat ramp, which is no longer there. So, um, there it is. Um, right from here. Anyways, you know, this is what kind of what was in the, the master plan for Riverview Park, and really kind of envisioning you got that whole big parking area that was there from from when there, there was a boat ramp there. So we're saying, all right, you know, let's take a new look at that that area. Everything sort of outside of the amphitheater, 
um, and see how that can be reworked, uh, what issues we need to look at, how we can better accommodate folks wanting to get closer to the river for the recreation. Also really how that can better integrate with the Independence Landing Park that's currently being developed. You know, we're, we designed and developed that part of that park on the lower terrace there. We want to make sure there's a unified flow from that park all the way to and through Riverview Park and we don't end up with, you know, one design here and one design there and you know, trails not connecting or styles you know, differing dramatically. So that was really kind of the goal here uh, to do that. You can go to the next slide. We, uh, Contracted with Greenworks uh, to come in and, and do this work. This is the kind of project schedule here. We really, you know, this being Riverview Park, we wanted to place a heavy emphasis on public outreach uh, and public input as far as what we should be thinking about doing there. We had um, several public open houses at the library and also at St. Patrick's Church. Uh, and we're now really at the end of this, uh, this um, task list here at the very bottom. Uh, what we're presenting to you today is Essentially, the final draft. We're not presenting any type of adoption uh, materials for you today because this is an opportunity for us to present so the final draft to you, get sort of last input, comments, feedback. I know most of you attended one or more of the open houses, uh, but we kind of want to take one last, uh, you know, stab at you guys before before finalizing things, and then one of the next uh, upcoming meetings will bring you uh, articles of uh, adoption for this. So with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Matthew Cranky from Greenworks. He's going to describe a little bit more about the process we went through and uh, how we got to where we are today. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Council. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. Thanks for uh, sharing uh, this evening with us. Um, next slide, please. Um, it's good to see some friendly faces here this evening. We've seen a number of you folks uh, in this room uh, through a couple of outreach opportunities. Uh, <clears throat> just to take a quick pass through some of the work that we've done with you and your community. Um, what we're looking at here is uh, some imagery from the original open house. Um, we started this process really big picture. Um, and in initial open houses, we wanted to assemble uh, the wish list, some of the big ideas, big thinking, and really get some feedback from the community about what was desirable within the park, uh, and really what was really already working within the park. Uh, next slide, please. So from this initial open house, um, we just build some, some pretty clear themes. Uh, there's a strong desire for enhanced play features, just top the list of feedback that we received uh, during the initial open houses. Um, there's a desire for active recreation opportunities. Uh, and guiding the uh, park uh, master plan is a strong, creating a strong connection to the river. This was reinforced in the feedback that we heard. Uh, we want to uh, generate some flexible space to continue to maintain some of the larger programmatic functions that you have within Riverview Park. Um, some of those existing programs were very strongly responded to. And then finally, we uh, heard a strong desire for improved social amenities. Next slide, please. So after we had the uh, original uh, open houses and we received this feedback, we went back to the laboratory and we wanted to generate uh, two very distinct plans to test some different ideas we came back before uh, the community and our, um, uh, as, as well as our, um, uh, the city. <clears throat> now, what you'll see here, uh, there is uh, one commonality that you see between these two schemes, and I'll be using this pointer behind you here, if, if that works. Oh, I guess not. Uh, just to orient you a little bit, downstream on this image is to the right, upstream is to the left, and the north is also to the right in this image. In both of these schemes, um, we wanted to make a distinct effort to clean up uh, the park and clarify circulation, come up with a structure with which we could organize the amenities within the park. And really, we wanted to first and foremost make sure that we were generating a park that uh, the city and community could be proud of. This first scheme here, you will see um, there is a very strong circulation pattern through the park. Um, we wanted to make sure that circulation was on the forefront of how we were structuring the park to make sure that it's safe and very accessible. In both of the original schemes we passed before the community, we took some efforts at um, creating an accessible circuit to the park. So you'll see that in both of these schemes. This first scheme here, uh, as distinct from the next one, you'll note that circulation, uh, vehicular circulation, extends all the way into the center of the park providing approximately 65 parking stalls. This uh, parking also allowed vehicular and accessible access to the central region uh, of the park 
which you'll see around numbers 7, 6, and 11. Those are the play area, the exercise area, and the large building, respectively. As part of the vehicular circulation, um, we also are proposing to lower the existing fill that's out there associated with the parking lot to provide stronger visual connections to within the park. Uh, you'll see featured on this plan is also a splash pad up around the uh, existing amphitheater. And um, on the right side of your image, you'll note that uh, we are maintaining the vehicular access down to the uh, existing gravel bar uh, just east of the biker boater campground. Next slide, please. <clears throat> In this scheme, again, you'll note that uh, a very similar pedestrian circulation pattern, creating that pedestrian circuit, accessible circuit through the park. Now, one of the standout differences here is that we pushed vehicular access and parking to the, uh, the south of the park, and this had a number of effects. One, drop off for um, boats uh, and for cars is centralized on that southern part of the park. This opened up a very large region uh, along the waterfront. You can see a uh, clear corridor from the amphitheater down to the water that's not obstructed by parking. Um, as you move towards that central area, um, <clears throat> where you, see, you will again see play uh, and exercise programs, but they have been pushed a little bit into the background and not quite as uh, in as a central location. In this scheme, you'll note that where that roundabout was in the previous scheme, it has been replaced with um, a gathering space and a, uh, a boardwalk ramp system allowing pedestrian access down to the water. Um, and then within the uh, biker motor uh, area, the campground, you'll note that we've inserted a new program, which is a um, interpretive walkway and wetland overlook. <coughs> uh, next slide, please. Now, after the, uh, the second open house, um, we again came to the community. We, we had a great time doing it and uh, had some good food. And um, we learned a couple um, pretty clear feedback messages. Uh, one, parking should be reconfigured to optimize use of the park. There was a pretty distinct difference between those two schemes, 65 parking stalls and approximately 33 parking stalls. Uh, it's important to include a splash pad. Again, play and splash pad program top the list, and we heard Bob clear that that was important. Uh, there's a, pre a preference for multiple covered shelters uh, instead of one large pavilion. The second scheme that we showed presented uh, a distribution of uh, covered shelters as opposed to that one large pavilion you saw in the first scheme. Uh, there's a preference for the play and exercise areas to be centrally located, uh, and we heard on numerous occasions that it's important to be, for these facilities to be accessible uh, and have accessible parking stalls in close proximity. Uh, we heard that it's important to include a waterfront gathering space, uh, important to optimize the river access opportunities that exist today, uh, to include the nature trails and wetland interpretive opportunities that I mentioned in that second scheme. Um, uh, and we heard uh, a theme echoed throughout both open houses uh, is that it's important for the park to be kid friendly and safe. Safety is a prime concern as it relates to vehicular and river access. Uh, and then finally, it's for the park improvements to support and enhance the Willamette River and Ash Creek ecosystems. Now, with that feedback, next slide, please. We again took the feedback and um, created uh, the greatest hits, really. We took uh, uh, the two schemes and uh, developed the recommended master plan, which you'll see here in front of you now. Um, and I will take you through the list of amenities that we're including to propose. Um, one, the waterfront multi-use trail, again, part of that pedestrian circuit is, is strongly featured in the preferred scheme, creating roughly a one-third mile loop through the park fully accessible. The splash pad you will see has been included up by the amphitheater, having the effect of extending that paved space when the splash pad is not in use, so that would allow for flexibility of program um, when the splash pad is turned off. This parking scheme finds a hybrid approach to uh, the two schemes that you saw previously, landing at approximately 
30, par uh, 50 parking stalls. Um, <clears throat> we have continued to extend the parking into uh, the center and the core area of Riverview Park, allowing that um, accessible parking access to the amenities that we described earlier. And we have tried to create a green uh, connection through the center of the parking so it doesn't re read as such an imposing uh, parking area like the first scheme that we talked about, this scheme too proposes to lower parking elevation to create a stronger visual connection from uh, the interior of the park down to the river. The uh, play area, exercise area, uh, are featured in the center of uh, the park, uh, close to both the drop-off area and the accessible parking stalls, uh, and are also orchestrated along with uh, the location of some of the small picnic shelters. Um, we heard the message during our open houses that it would be a benefit to consolidate these features so parents coming uh, to the park with children could have them in close eyesight, potentially benefit from shaded areas, or also engage the exercise equipment. <clears throat> uh, the river access in this location, uh, in this scheme, uh, you'll see that there are two points of access. Like the first scheme we looked at, this scheme maintains the existing vehicular drive down to the gravel bar. This scheme proposes that it would be uh, controllable, potentially by a bollard if it is uh, deemed uh, needed. Uh, this would be uh, in close proximity to the Piker Boater Campground to build on that program and continue to serve as a draw uh, to visitors using the Willamette River Trail. The second access point you'll see is on the left of your image in the bottom left, which is uh, associated with some accommodating river grades. Um, this would be a location where it would be easy to walk down the bank and enter a, a location in the river where there are is a shallow water entry, potentially for wading uh, or swimming. Um, and then we have uh, a watercraft, uh, I'm sorry, a, a river overlook, which is located centrally in the plan as an extension of a large lawn space and reaches out towards the river and it is also tied into that stream circuit. Watercraft staging uh, and a bike kiosk are located over by the roundabout, uh, also supporting the bike or boater campground, uh, as well as the vehicle, potentially the vehicular access down to the river. Um, you'll note that the bike or boater campground is shown with improved uh, plantings around it to clarify uh, where the campgrounds uh, are. It is also developed uh, with a camp host that you see um, located to the left of Meadow. And um, like the second scheme we looked at previously, we have included the Interpretive Wetland Trail and Overlook, uh, as this is uh, potentially a wonderful learning opportunity and interpretive, uh, uh, interpretive location. Next slide, please. So it has been Really, really wonderful to work on this project. Uh, Independence has a really unique um, public waterfront, um, and we have been working closely with Sean, David, and the community, and many of the members in this room uh, to come up with a vision that will connect the Riverview uh, Park with some of the other public uh, open space to the south, Independence Landing, as well as to the continuation of the trail system to the north, all the way up to the park complexes, and make sure that. Uh, Riverview Park can serve as an anchor for the activation of downtown and support the community um, who, val who values a rich sense of place. And with that, I'll turn the mic over to uh, Sean. Yeah, so I think that's really kind of the extent of our presentation. Um, if you have questions or thoughts, uh, love to hear them. Uh, like I said, we didn't, didn't uh, deliberately did not bring any uh, you know, uh, adopting resolutions tonight. I just wanted to give you guys a chance to look at it, think about it, uh, and then we'll be doing that um, in one of the subsequent council meetings. So if you've got any questions, uh, feel free to Questions at this there. point? Uh, I would just like to say, if, uh, we're gonna be bringing it up pretty soon, maybe we can have a little advanced copy of the study at home. Yeah. I appreciate that. Absolutely beautiful and very well done. Um, are we going to retain the um, disc golf course? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was not specifically listed in there, but that definitely is something we can work in. Other comments from this end? 
I'm just really grateful for the fact that you did, in fact, listen to substantial community input and, and urging schemes A and B. And thank you. Yeah, it's exciting to see it. You guys did a wonderful job. Yes. I do have a question regarding the place structures. When, when it's time to make decisions on when you including uh, some input, community input or uh, request some input from some of the local this early childhood education specialists. Yeah, and it, that's actually a good point to clarify. This is the master plan. This is not something we're going to go out and build tomorrow. Uh, so there will be uh, a lot of opportunities for dialing this in even further and saying, all right, we're, we are going to build a playground. This is specifically what we're going to build. And that's an opportunity where we will want to reach out to the community again and say, hey, let's you know, help us design this there and help us figure out what really makes the most sense here. Awesome. Thank you. I want to really com compliment, comment, compliment. One, I really appreciated the strong efforts in community outreach. Uh, I had the chance to uh, uh, to join you when you went to St. Patrick's Church, and it was just 150 people participating, and not just a little bit. I mean, it was it was pretty intense. Every all members of the family were pretty intense. I really appreciate that that outreach and putting things together. And uh, like what's been also said, this is really exciting that over the years to come because this won't all happen in one big bite. Uh, but then in the years to come, you know, we've done pretty well when we've had a plan. We, we, we have a plan and work the plan and uh, taking the opportunities as they come, uh, both funding and other people who want to help, whether it's, you know, in the past we've used the National Guard, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and lots of folks to, to help make things happen. So I'm really excited that this uh, this will become our plan for the future. It, uh, and it, I like how it, it fits. It fits with all the parts, and uh, I'm excited for the future here. So thank you for, for doing that. We look forward to uh, uh, being having an opportunity to uh, officially provide an okie dokie on the plan, so that uh, we can begin working the plan. Anything else, folks? Thank you, appreciate that. Thank, Thank you for being here this Mr. Klein, I think it's back to you. Okay. Uh, Mayor, members, council, thank you. So uh, just a typical list. Uh, a couple things from Karen. Uh, uh, we, as you know, there's an election pending and the deadline's in August, so if you have, if anybody has questions, about you know, getting your spills in, if anybody the audience, whatever, uh, please contact Karen about uh, any election questions you may have. Uh, similarly, if you could reach out to Karen by Friday if you have an, if you, you do have an interest or no in attending the league's uh, annual conference in September. Uh, again, if, again, if you're new to the council or have not been to any of these in the past, uh, this one should be uh, an improved event, I believe. I think the level of training will be stepped up, so it should be, uh, it'll be in Eugene at the Hilton, correct? Yeah, at the Hilton, at the Hilton. Um, anyway, if you would contact Karen by Friday in one way or another, confirm your plans to either attend or not attend, that would help her with her, uh, with securing rooms and securing uh, registrations and the other necessities. Um, I don't know if we can, Karen, can we hand out the priority requests from LOC? Yeah, okay. but I got it here. Okay, so we have, we will hand those out to you shortly, but the league has requested input as they do uh, typically uh, in advance of the uh, coming legislative session for priorities from our city council. Um, they're, they, this, this year might be a tad unique in that they're asking not only for your top four, they're asking for your bottom four, things that really are of no interest to you that you'd like the legislature not to waste their time on. Which probably might be a better result than the one that's been there. May, may I add to your, to your comments, please? Yes. Thank you. As, as you know, I'm a past president of the League of Oregon Cities, and uh, the, uh, the priorities that you are getting a chance to look at have been developed by the policy committees, statewide policy committees of other elected officials, everything from water, taxation, uh, transportation. Uh, telecom is a whole uh, huge groups of people who've worked on this 
and they put together uh, groups of recommendations and in all 241 cities in Oregon are going to get the opportunity to uh, submit uh, what their priorities are. So you're going to get those tonight and at the second meeting in uh, July, we'll, we'll figure out what our top four are as a group and then submit that. Top to bottom, that's right. And uh, so we'll get a chance to, uh, to weigh in and we'll submit that. Then the Board of Directors of the League of Oregon Cities will meet on uh, in uh, mid-August uh, to uh, officially adopt what our uh, uh, work strategy and priorities are for the League in the coming legislative session because uh, there's a lot of work to be done to both move things forward and protect us from errant thoughts that some may have when they get to the Capitol building. And so uh, it is pretty important. So I uh, just want to let you know that the work you do makes a huge difference in, uh, in what goes through. And I just also want, I'll be part of that phone call also as the past president. I also want to let you know that uh, I'm really excited with what the league's been doing lately. Uh, with some new leadership. Uh, uh, there's a lot of really, really good things that are going on, and I really encourage you to attend the conference if you can. It's, uh, it, it really is worth it, and uh, you'll learn a lot from other elected officials. And thank you, uh, Mr. Klein, for letting me step all over your presentation. As I, it was great. So, as I so frequently do. Yeah, that's great. So, a couple of meetings that you have coming up on, on normal, your normal, your regular session, and your first meeting in July, July 10th will be a work session. Uh, it will be dedicated to essentially to you meeting with the recruiter. I will not be there that evening, so you can say all sorts of nasty things about me, how you want the next person to be nothing like me, that kind of those kinds of things. Uh, anyway, you'll have that opportunity to meet with them both, uh, the recruiter, both collectively and individually. And I believe Amanda will be uh, will be working with there and helping set that up. Um, that's on the 10th. The evening before, we're asking you to be in a special session. At 6 p.m., well, not at 6.30, but at 6 p.m., uh, uh, with respect to MyNet. And so that is, uh, that is a special meeting. Uh, we'll have your attorney present by telephone. It'll be mostly executive session. So, but there will be a public portion to that as well. Um, on the same topic as, we, as we're there, since we're there anyway, uh, you will, you may know in the paper tomorrow that I owe that there will be a public notice uh, that talks about uh, a bond issue, a meeting that is in Parker, Arizona. So if you rush, you can get down there for their July 13th meeting. Uh, you may not be interested or you're a warm. Um, but uh, there will be, they'll be considering a bond issue. That bond issue is described as it, in, as it is in the, in the notice. It does, it does impact on MyNet, the matters, are, that are being discussed will be discussed uh, uh, by the United Board in, on this Friday, at which time, there, if depending on how that goes, there will, there will be a, a more public information available. What you know, you'll know from the paper. That's all, that's all that can be said publicly on this matter for, for the time being. We're all under non-disclosure agreements on this process. That's what I can say. That is a federally required notice. That's why that's out in advance of the actual disclosure date, if you will. Yes. So, a little odd. Um, so, if you're looking for public and works employees this week, you're going to be, well, if you go out and look at all anywhere around the 4th of July events, the Independence Day events, you'll find them doing one thing or another because they're extremely busy getting ready for that event and printing up the community as best we can. But that doesn't take much work. It's a gorgeous community. But a little work that they're working on, wherever we kind of went. Um, and anyway, that, that's ongoing, so if you're looking for that. The uh, building department is actually starting to experience some backlogs. Uh, we they are getting, there is a lot of permits in hand at this point in time, application. So we are working on whatever we can to uh, get that a little more efficient. So we need a software solution. We're working on that desk very hard. And we will be hopefully implement something shortly to help relieve that backlog. So, uh, but we are working to get all those permits processed and get those folks out on the road, out on the streets, and then there are lots working hard. Um, there's tons and tons of activity in the building, as you can see out there. Uh, the brewery uh, will be delayed. It's open a little bit. I told you last time, maybe August, but I sort of 
fudge on that, I guess. Uh, there is some asbestos uh, to be abated over there, so you'll, at some point in time, that's actually seeing the folks in spacesuits over there are removing some of the asbestos in the building. That's a standard practice, and then they'll be available to finish up the remodeled interior and get those folks open and underway. Um, Mechanical uh, has completed their refinance. They have paid us off. We are no longer a lien holder on that property. So we are out of that business entirely. And we received full payment for uh, what was outstanding. Um, parking lot is all but com is nearly completed over behind the Main Street properties. The striping will be held off until after the 4th, uh, at which time we'll also have lights installed. Uh, electric vehicle charging stations are first. We'll have a little event around that. Um, as you look north of our building here, if you see where there's a fair amount of excavation occurred, and that is for landscaping, that should be completed and at least the, the dirt put it back in place before the before the holidays so that we don't have people have, we don't have a trip trip and fall hazard over there. Um, we don't want people coming back from the fireworks. Check it out. Um, the Valkyrie Wine Tavern should be open as a temporary occupancy for the 4th, so that's kind of exciting. Um, it'll be temporary, it's not, it won't be totally completed, but they have all their temporary permits for the OLCC, so they're pretty much ready to go, it's just kind of finish some interior work, and if you've been anywhere by there, they're working awfully hard to get that, that done. Uh, we received a grant from Transportation Growth Management, uh, uh, state uh, state, uh, state office to do a targeted industry analysis for the industrial property around the airport. Uh, we've been has been in the works for a while, so we're pretty pretty pleased to get that done. Uh, it'll help us identify industry clusters that can leverage proximity to the airport and any infrastructure or land use changes needed to make this happen. So that's fairly long winded to say that we are working to get jobs out there very hard, and we've got a grant to help us do that and identify what kinds of jobs what we need to do to make that happen in terms of public investment or private investment. Um, we're, we're completing our training on the virtual situation for the force. So looking forward to a great launch on that. It should be fun. Uh, they're coming and flying in again this weekend, and the actual rollout will be here throughout the festival. So that should be yeah, pretty fun. Uh, let's see, we have presented several times. This last week had a couple of national tech conferences in Portland about tech innovation efforts of independence. Uh, just continue to grow our presence there and farm before tracking partnership with Intel. Lots of interest from folks on other people wanting to do things. So independence just continues to be, you know, in, be that brand. And uh, we are meeting here shortly also with our uh, the film crew to do, uh, we're not quite set up for it yet, but we will be, sometime this summer, we'll put it together, the, uh, the uh, uh, layout, the, the messaging and the layout and the, 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 the program for the film crew to do ICMA TV. I mentioned this last time, so we've got that, all those contracts in place and they're working on that. Uh, Sean will be speaking at Representative Evans Livability Forum this Wednesday. Uh, at the same time, there will be an ag tech meetup uh, touring the Rick Real Dairy Wednesday night. Again, that's something we co sponsor those events. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the workings of the airport master plan, uh, 5 30 this Thursday in the event center will be an open house. Uh, there is a committee meeting just before that. I believe that's open to the public. Uh, yeah, to, to listen and listen and not participate. So, but that's available to the public as well. I don't believe there's a participation. Yeah, there'll be an opportunity somewhere and all that. Um, and then just finally, water, as you know, it's, you know, Salem continues to experience their problems. We have uh, made arrangements with the Department of Correction. They should be uh, looking to uh, bolster their supply from our system. And of course, we have the, uh, the for Salem residents, we have places to fill up, you know, that live here, work in Salem. They're welcome to come by, stop at our fill up station down here and get some water for the day or whatever. Um, that's what I have this evening. Questions? Can you repeat the whole thing? Yes, I can. <laughs> um, 
I wanted to, I had a chance to uh, be in the same uh, uh, meeting with uh, Steve Powers, the city manager of, of Salem, and he, he took uh, specific time to come over across the room to tell me how much he appreciated because the city of Independence was uh, one of the first, if not the first, to reach out to them when their water crisis hit. And um, he was extremely appreciative of uh, your phone call and the staff were, uh, they, he was really personally touched that uh, they weren't in this alone. And it made a, it was a big deal to him. He, he went on for a bit to say how much of it, uh, they really appreciated the neighborliness. And um, um, that's, a, that's a wonderful compliment from, um, from them. And I just wanted to let you and the staff know that it was sincerely appreciated. They asked that I specifically mention that to all of you in this meeting. Thank you for that. We, we uh, he, the city managers meet once a month at the Magnetic Council of Governments. He spent a good portion of that talking about lessons learned from this, and there were a lot for him and his staff. It was a, they've gone through some exceptional challenges, and their, you know, their it, surface water treatment was something we're not into yet, but we will be, presents tons of challenges anyway. And so it's just, uh, you know, he's learning all about that. Additional, any questions from staff? I mean, for, for staff? If not, I'm going to continue us moving forward. Okay. Um, I think you have, uh, uh, I think you have uh, Ramon Martinez. Speak. Yes, please. So uh, Ramon Martinez is our new, uh, who is our community engagement office, our community engagement manager. Uh, we work through the titles. Uh, community page manager is going to talk to you about, you know, he's been on the job with us now for several months. He's going to talk to you about so what is going on in his world and some of the things he's doing, and he's been extremely active. And I think you have a presentation to go with us. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the uh, City Council. Thank you for having me, Council. Um, um, before I just touch on my work, my report, brief report, I just kind of want to just briefly provide us a snapshot of my service background. Um, if my background is really, it's played a big role in why I'm here today, standing for you. Um, but uh, my experiences have taken me across the country doing national uh, disaster relief efforts uh, with AmeriCorps, FEMA, and the National Guard. I've done work with, I've done youth development work with the Utah Conservation Corps, and um, also done Habitat for Humanity work in 13 different states. And a lot of that is all kind of compiled and just really just um, led me to, it just have helped uh, uh, develop my perspective and uh, this, this love for serving. Um, so my path has, I'm really happy that my path has led me to Oregon and ultimately here. Um, and so during my two months of uh, work, uh, a lot has been centered around getting acquainted with my Sorry. role. Um, a lot has centered around getting acquainted with my role and establishing those key connections. And uh, so uh, my involvement has been uh, at service level with a lot of groups and organizations, but as I get more experienced and seasoned, I'll be able to dive in deeper with efforts. And, um, but so far, the two month mark, I'm, I'm really pleased with how things, I think I have a good lay of the land. Um, but some of the uh, efforts can uh, participating in locally, it's been helping out with, um, I think my first intro to the community with the chess program that was at the library and I foresee myself being more involved throughout the group. Uh, let's see here, and then also being uh, president at IES more in Prentice Elementary School and kind of my first intro there was linking up with the PE teacher there, Nate Reiner, and helping out with their miles program. Those kids have a lot of energy and it's really fun to be in the mix there. Uh, and then with both of those connections, both of those examples, I, this has kind of been my, kind of my, um, a, a good lead into make, making connections with parents. And I uh, just want to keep that going. Uh, and also, uh, one of my other first uh, experiences in the community garden area has been attending service integration team meetings, which are held in Monmouth at the Christian Church down there. And it's a, a monthly gathering that draws almost about 30 organizations, not just in our immediate area, but in the whole county. And that has really given me a big perspective of uh, services that are offered uh, in our community, which is incredible. A lot of caring people. It's a very caring group, and I'm 
I'm really glad to be in the mix there. And tomorrow's the end of the year uh, celebration, so I'm really happy to be there. Um, just, just be in the mix and um, also celebrate past experiences before I came along. Um, so they helped out a little bit with the Independence Police Department and helped out with, uh, helped get the word out with their Kill the Bus program or Kill the Bus event, which was had two kind of objectives: one being uh, support the local food pantry, and two it, it had a uh, service or it had a helmet component. It really kind of providing helmets to, to our community, and that gave that was able to supply uh, 50 um, helmets to our area youth. So really. It was a pretty awesome result. Uh, so also helping out with their, I uh, just recently helped out with their Spanish uh, competency tests. And it's really great to help, uh, to assist um, Sergeant White Nose in that effort. Um, the community fiesta planning is underway, August 24th to 26th, and that will be here before we know it. And, but linking up with the community member, Elena Pena, and very excited to be in that mix there, and joining forces with her and, and some of the city staff. Um, let's see here. So also, uh, summer school efforts. Uh, the next meeting will be actually be tomorrow. We have um, meeting up the team there and and really uh, trying to identify uh, ways that the city can uh, enhance their efforts of really uh, just keeping that spirit of summer school high. Um, and also, you, some of you have probably saw this in the community, but just kind of a, for fun, uh, just a weekly gathering for uh, runners and walkers. It's kind of a nice way to give folks a nice reason to get out the door and get their comfy shoes on and meet their neighbors. And also it has a uh, kind of a tasty component to it too. So we're kind of trying to encourage the uh, eat local. And so we got, uh, I can provide these later, but we've got a Spanish and an English version here. Really uh, kind of, uh, I'll, I'll start scanning these across the area more, but I can have you guys check these out uh, after this meeting. Give you a little preview here. Uh, really, uh, just uh, also uh, up, in, up on deck would be my, or I guess some really great opportunities to, uh, well, my first opportunity to really enhance the work I'm doing is this Thursday I'll be attending the Latino Equity, the Health Equity Conference in Portland, and really hope to gain a lot from that and come back with more tools in my tool belt. And uh, also another, uh, a lot of, uh, pretty wonderful opportunity came about uh, here at the city level uh, to uh, professional development opportunity to uh, get, uh, take the certificate in uh, local government with uh, focuses on the fundamentals of equity and inclusion specialization. So really excited about that. Thank you for that. And, and then with that, I'll just finish by just saying I'm really excited to be here and uh, onward. <laughs> Are there any questions? Questions for uh, the moment? Please. No? That was chat. Just a comment. Just uh, I really appreciate uh, you being so active right from the get go, kind of meeting with partners, getting the different agencies. You visited OCDC too, and uh, we don't know that about what we do and our migrant families that are here in town. So thank you very much for taking the time to do that. Great time to talk. Great. Additional questions. Yes, I want a copy of that so I can publish it for you. My yes, it's a lot of better. Now we're a monthly magazine and we give out to the community information. Awesome. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate you taking the time to visit with us this evening. Yes. Um, we have a we have a request for a uh, a five minute. Probably two. A five minute break. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna recess for five minutes and we'll come back for our final item. Okay, we're back in session, folks. Thank you, everybody, for uh, thanks to council members. Really appreciated your indulgence. Um, we're going to go to unfinished business, and I'm not sure who's carrying this. Uh, Mr. Klein, Mr. Pals, uh, you've got the ball. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to thank Karen, actually, first of all, for putting me after Ramon. <laughs> Somebody's talking about empowering people to telling people what they can't do. So, um, so your June 12th City Council meeting, you ask um, staff to prepare uh, a brief uh, discussion about how we got to this prohibition on violent fencing. So the, you have a memo in front of you. Right. Um, 
I'll just briefly talk about that and, and try to answer any questions you might have. So um, this this issue came about um, um, from a question from a resident of the airport inquiring as to some of the specifics on the city's fencing regulations, um, specifically height and material types. And in fact, the city has a prohibition on vinyl fencing um, since 2012. Um, uh, vinyl fences have been uh, illegal in the city of Independence, and that um, was uh, a discussion that started, I believe, in 2010 as, as part of a discussion around um, a, a broader look at residential design standards and looking at um, ways to improve the aesthetics of homes um, and create more neo traditional um, aesthetic in, in the city's new development areas. Um, it wasn't adopted in 2010, um, it, was, it wasn't adopted until 2012, um, but nonetheless, it was adopted. Um, the city recorder and I did a little bit of digging through those minutes where that um, ordinance was adopted, and we're not able to find a, a lot of detail around the city's discussion um, in that adoption. Um, but you know, it was approved, it was approved um, as part of a, a typical ordinance. So um, the way that works is that we would have sent at that time a notice to the Department of Land Conservation and Development 40 days in advance. This is just kind of the standard procedure for a many area development code. Um, and then a public notice was published in, in the local newspaper 20 days in advance. We had a planning commission hearing. Um, the planning commission made a recommendation to the city council. We had another, we had another public hearing before the city council where um, residents were invited to participate and provide testimony. And the city council ultimately um, made a decision to prohibit vinyl um, fences. So we're here today um, uh, with a prohibition on vinyl fences. Um, the, the question was asked at the last meeting on June 12th if there's the ability to. Um, uh, withhold enforcement of the city's um, fencing prohibition. And the, and the advice we got from the city attorney was essentially that uh, it would be unwise to do so. The city this, the city has the discretion to, to execute um, um, its enforcement at its, at its leisure. However, um, we do not have the ability to um, not enforce discretion should we get a complaint from the public. And so the advice we got was that, um, you know, if, if, if we, if we gave the advice to a particular resident that we would, we would withhold um, enforcement, we would still be obligated to enforce if we were uh, in receipt of a complaint from a resident on that issue. Um, that's, that's essentially it in a nutshell. I wanted to just provide, um, and this is in response to a question from one of the counselors, um, some feedback with, with our plans for amending the development code as we go forward. I, I, I created a little uh, printout for all of you. Maybe I'll just pass it out so we can Um, currently, the planning staff, um, I guess the city has planning staff availability for about 0.6 to 0.7 FTE uh, per year. So that's, we're, we're here for about three days a week is essentially what that means. Um, so we're responsible for, in addition to code amendments, um, uh, responsible for staffing from counter, uh, attending meetings with the public and development community, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, again, we have, we have Availability currently for about 0.6 FTE. Um, our, our, our current planning responsibilities, which include again attending the front counter and responding to development requests, consume about uh, two thirds of that time. So I'd say they consume about 0.4 to 0.5 FTE, which leaves um, roughly, let's just say 400, 400 to 500 hours per, per year to take on code amendments. And so what? Um, what this list is, is this is a current list of amendments that we know um, or, or have received requests um, to make to the development code or other um, long-range planning projects that, that we know are in the pipeline. Things like amending our transportation system plan, looking at um, opportunities to uh, identify funding opportunities for public improvements in the Southwest Independence Concept area, et cetera, et cetera. So they, those are, these are all either long-range planning activities or code amendment projects that are likely to require uh, planning effort in the next couple of years. And what, what this list is for, and this list will continue to grow as we receive requests like this request to amend our code or um, uh, potentially amend our code for violent offenses, um, we anticipate that this, this will just be kind of an ongoing log of amendments to the development code that on an annual basis we can come before you and, and show you and then based on our availability, the resources we have 
the planning department, you can select what are your highest priorities um, in, in a way that in a way that is 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 meaningful. Like it's in a way that we can actually allocate resources to. In a way that, and based on those resources, we we expect to be able to get done in that year. And so um, I mentioned in my um, staff note to you that we we would like to. I guess our recommendation from the planning department is to include this request to amend the code um, on this list of, of items for you to review um, in, in coordination with these other items so that we can do it in kind of a more coordinated and efficient manner. Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of a summary of, of where we're at and um, our recommendation in a nutshell. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Council members, I'm going to start the other. Does the other end want to start this time? Or Tom, no. Tom I think you want to. I'm trying to pass it around. I keep always turning to the right. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, you're talking about doing a general update of the uh, uh, code, development code, uh, which would be the part that include fences. And, and I think the timetable you had mentioned was that we would start that process at the beginning of uh, 2019. What, what we've done in other cities is that as part of your like, annual goal setting discussions or budgeting discussions, um, that would be the time I think would be, um, it would make the most sense to, to, to review that so that you can see you know, here, here's, either, here's a planning department budget or here are our goals and relative to those goals, how, how do you want to allocate this department's time to these different projects? So you can really decide whenever you want to do this. Um, but yeah, I was thinking um, at the first of the year or on the budget. That would be just to decide what our priority areas are. Correct. Not to actually start the process. Correct. Correct. Yep. Yes. I want to back up a little bit and ask how recently have there been any complaints about vinyl fencing? Since I've been here, um, I started here in May of last year, I don't believe I've received a complaint about vinyl fencing. Because I know there's a fairly prominent one on Monmouth Street. And I personally would, because we're going to be having a new city manager next year, I wouldn't want to um, dilute a goal setting session with things like this. This is more. Uh, housekeeping, updating, advancing, and so on, and I think this would, would deserve some some separated um, review of that and not not just step on the goal setting. I have a question just for clarification here. I mean, uh, I'm going from the uh, from large to small. <coughs> just, just so I make sure that I understand. Uh, even if we wanted to do anything, just the process with the, with the notifications, planning commission, with the whole, just just moving any you know any process forward, that's a several month process. That's actually two or three months in the. I think it's about three months. It's about three months, even if we said go at the moment. That's right. Okay, I, I just wanted to clarify that that uh, that's that's in October. Yeah, it's, it's a, that's October. Even if there was a go at that at this one, um, I appreciate for that 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 clarification. Um, and while I'm sensitive to you know folks who are trying to do the right thing, um, and. Uh, yeah, it, sometimes the process is, well, sometimes the legally required process is a challenge. Excuse me. I, I'm going to defer to that side of things. Yeah, go ahead. Excuse me. I, <laughs> so I, I noticed that in the report was kindly included um, the expense to, in the past, of, uh, for instance, the setback amendment that was done. So. I mean, this is a pretty comprehensive list of overall goals. Is there a similar list of code items that could perhaps be addressed all at once rather than, than piecemeal to help reduce 
the financial impact yeah. of rising that cost? Yeah, and so, right, so good question. And, and, and that this list will be that list that we haven't received beside this. We haven't really received any formal requests for, um, I guess, simplified code amendments that we haven't taken on yet. The city recorder and I are currently working on uh, a project very similar to that. It's kind of a general housekeeping um, update to the to the development code um, that's just correcting references and scrivener's errors and things like that. The development code, the, from what I understand, the city has worked on that for the last couple of years. We're wrapping that up now. We hope to have that to you. Um, but but right as as we continue to receive requests similar to the one we have in front of us today, we'll continue to add those items to this list. So this a, a lot of the things you see here on these first 15 things, 15 items are, are far more significant major. Right. Right. Things, right? But, um, this list would also include um, the more simple, just basic code amendments. But um, the, the idea of putting them all together was so that, again, um, based on resources that are available in the planning department at any given year, you can kind of pick and choose which things from those different um, levels of effort are, are important to you to, to tackle in that, in that upcoming year. Additional questions? Um, well, I guess I, I kind of get back to the matter at hand is, is the, the final fence that these people want to put in. Uh, I understand that legally there's nothing we can do at this moment to take care of this. Um, and uh, Councillor Martin had mentioned a moratorium about you know not enforcing that. Do, would we need to do that? We don't really enforce a lot of our code unless it's complaint driven or it's new development or something like that. That's correct. You're right. Yeah. Um, so there, there would be no need to do anything for the council to do anything. It would be at their risk whether they want to put this in and hopefully the neighbors and the rest of the city's understanding and wouldn't do anything. But it, we would be forced to act if somebody complained, right? Mm -hmm. We're obligated to. I mean, that's, that's kind of the central role of the planning department is that we have, we're kind of obligated to enforce the, the adaptive rules we talked about. But you're right. So, I mean, in, in you know, a very um, good point was brought up that, well, um, we essentially are penalizing people for coming to, to ask um, about how, what's the correct way to, to, to proceed. Um, and that's, that's true. Um, um, but essentially, uh, our answer to that question has to be consistent with Can I, I, I just, I hate to, it's not true that it's penalized for asking. So I just do want to clarify on that point because the, the risk to the person who acts in non compliance with our code is much higher than those that come in and ask. Um, you know, there is, there are daily penalties up to $500 for non compliance. So that is the risk when you go forth and act absent, you know, express permission. Um, but I would also say, because we, we struggle with this with the Historic Preservation Commission, um, we, and this is maybe a little aside of just the vinyl fencing issue, um, we need to think of ways that we can promote good behavior, promote people, you know, better advertising, better education, whatever we can do uh, to get people to comply. Because people are, I mean, honestly, people are just, not paying attention and doing stuff all over town and not getting penalized for it. Uh, yeah, if we want to go out and start complaining, you know, we can find these people, but, but it's, it's not happening. Uh, hence, some of the vinyl fencing that we do have that is not necessarily the quality we want to see. Uh, so I guess I would, to that end, I, I would hope we could maybe do some thinking of, the, of some way, and I know we're struggling with that with the Historic Preservation Commission, that, of ways we can help promote good behavior and, and educate the public so that they know when they should check, what they can do to check. Yeah. Um, and I don't mean to take away from that, but I think that would probably you were looking at me when you were making those comments. I, I, well, it's a, it's a broader, it's a yeah. much broader. I mean, so, you know, what is good behavior, what is expectations, you know, when you when you adopted the residential design standards, 
you know, there, the idea, the notion was to improve the quality of local community, you know, sort of level of consistency, and restore sort of that, you know, the traditional look of cookie and, you know, and how neighborhoods are designed and built. We start, to the extent, staff just takes this direction from council on these things. So, you know, we want, certainly want to get a good education campaigns, you know, talk to people about incentives, you know, to, to in fact, make changes that are consistent with this, like the historic preservation grants that we issue. You know, we work in many ways to try to encourage what you are calling good behavior. But at the same time, you, you give us a list of prohibitions, we also have to act, you know, for that. I mean, it's, you wouldn't like what it would look like if we arbitrarily, as staff chose, what laws we want to enforce, what we don't want to enforce. That's not, you know, that's not how government works effectively, efficiently, and fairly. So I mean, to the extent that you have a lot of the books we're sort of obligated, it's, we are obligated to enforce, and we've taken a complaint-driven approach to enforcement so that it's not heavy-handed. But that, and so, you know, as you say, there are plenty of people who sort of take it upon themselves to either consciously or unconsciously, you know, have no idea that they're violating our code because they don't reach out and ask that question in the first place or don't care. Uh, either way, if no one complains, you know, they score, they score at least a temporary victory. Um, at the end of the day, if you want to see a change, then it really is on you to take this banner up, tell us to take this to the planning commission. We'll take this out of sequence. That certainly is a, an available option, and we'll, you know, that's what we'll do. That's our jobs, and that's we would do that without a complaint. You know, I think Zach's job is to inform you that, you know, how we do business now, how we try to efficiently manage those resources that we have. As he said, he's on, you know, basically 60% time, you know, surveying the community, and we're managing a lot of development at this point in time, you know, as I was telling you a little bit earlier. So it's it's always a balancing act, but whatever is a priority, you are in charge of helping us set those priorities. So, so other, you want yes, to comment? Okay, I do. Please. I know that uh, it had been suggested that after the beginning of 2019, we would be looking at um, maybe a bulk of changes to the, the um, code. Is there any reason that that can't be started at an earlier date since you had mentioned that there weren't a lot of suggestions for code changes that were at this level? Could we not get that started before the end of this year, like in October? And it would be kind of nice to see the city council right now be, um, be able to follow through on this because uh, we all have some collective experience here and, and what's gone before and what's going on now. And I also think that uh, I know you can't can't force people to read the code, and I would ask my enemy to read the code. <laughs> it's not a pleasant read, but I think that um, that we need to look at some of those archaic things and the things that are out of date and start dealing with them before the press of all this new uh, building comes on and all the new things that are happening in the park and in Independence Landing. Let's just Let's just get going on it and get the process moving now. So, Mr. Klein, I think you wanted to uh, add something here. No, I, you know, and I've talked to Zach, and he certainly, I think he's ready to make that kind of move, and certainly move it up in your, in your direction. I, I, I would know that that press of development is already on us, not, not that it's coming, it's already here. Um, but uh, that said, uh, you know, and Zach experienced the building official, we all experience it every day. That said, I think you know, Zach can make that alteration in his schedule and take this on. So if October is a target date, I think we're happy to do that. Again, if you want to take this particular matter out of sequence and move it up, you know, we also take we can also do that as well. Um, that is the recommendation to you, but it is, you know, we understand that it may be a priority before you. So what we can do here, so I'm, I'm trying to kind of coalesce around direction here, is that uh, so the suggestion is do this in you know get, get this started in October because building season will have been built and or and you know most people aren't going to start a lot of new construction as the rains begin because that makes it sound like a, like the uh, like the jungle uh, and we can begin that process then um, it doesn't necessarily help the specific situation but we weren't going to get to it till October anyway. You know, and yes, 
I know that that doesn't make everybody happy, but I think that might, does that seem like a as reasonable a way to, to move things forward? Uh, well, and, and I, yeah, and, and, and I'm asking. I'm, you know, I'm just, uh, go ahead. I, I think if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. I mean, although it's not ideal for some of our city uh, residents here. So, other comments? Would there be a possibility of a, of a courtesy contract in the event that some kind of complaint is turned in? To what end? I'm sorry. If, if there's a complaint on the, the, the vinyl fencing, the specific one that has been brought to our attention here, if there's a complaint that does come in, is there a possibility of doing a courtesy call since that a particular constituent made the effort to come in and start all this going. I'm not. Well, my question would be, what purpose does the courtesy call? Just to say that we're we're complaint uh, driven on our enforcement and we've received a complaint. Forearm, forewarned, that's all. And this is in the event that the fence is, is constructed prior to the code being amended to do that? Can um, I? Can is I? The, is the that call would go out to the constituent before code enforcement uh, took it down there? No, I think it could be done through code enforcement. Their normal process is to, so yeah, I think typically issue warnings anyway. Okay. They work with folks, so I don't think, I think we can fairly light hand on most of our code enforcement. Right. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask a question about the code enforcement real quick? I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let, uh, I'm gonna let you connect up with, with the staff people who give, give you detail on code enforcement. I don't think any of us have we have to this. We are, no, we are. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is I understand it, and tell me if I'm wrong, is we'll see that we'll see something coming back in October and st starting a process. Is that what we're kind of talking about? Or more involved Yeah, they kind of But if you start in October, thing. it's three months from there before it's approved. So Okay. All right. So we get to it. I'm sorry. Um, we are now into uh, council announcements. People have announcements. Just please, really quick. I don't know if you all noticed uh, the wave of uh, new families coming into town this summer. Uh, lots of cars from California and all. And I just want to say welcome to those families that are coming here from out of the state, uh, doing really hard work uh, out in the field. And, Kind of want to say, uh, welcome to the city of the Independence. Bienvenidos a la ciudad de Independence. Great. I want to offer. I'm offering kudos today. I want to specifically. I know the planning or the uh, public works director is here, and I just wanted to uh, say I uh, was down at the Saturday market this last weekend, and they and many other people are very, very appreciative of the work you folks put in to take care of some of the sidewalks that the city yes. has. Uh, Control over, you know, where the lift of concrete is. Uh, folks came in, got the work done. People were thrilled, and thank you for getting that done before the Fourth of July. Really appreciated that. And uh, several people made comment as I went in for uh, my weekly goodies down at the uh, Saturday market is either a cinnamon roll or a, or a ten-minute massage. So I have a choice. <laughs> You're so evil. Yes, one is less fattening. Um, but uh, several people make comments. I just really appreciate wanting to know that it's noticed, it's appreciated. Thank you very much. And uh, I love the work you do. Is there anything else that we need to do tonight, folks? Um, I'm going to throw in a quick plug for the Little Bit Big Forum downstairs tomorrow night, 6 to 8. I'll give you the offers and input to get some answers. And I'll make our community an even more wonderful place. Great. I also want to extend, I, I neglected to do this earlier, I wanted to thank Representative Paul Evans who's come to join us this evening just to uh, get uh, reconnected with uh, municipal government and uh, I really appreciate seeing the former mayor uh, with us tonight and uh, appreciate all his support for our community and uh, thank you for being here, appreciate that. If somebody would like to send us home, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you very much.